I'm going to try to, in the next little while, I'm going to try to talk a little bit about this beautiful story of the woman at the well and uh, that we find in the Gospel of John chapter 4. And I'm going to try to, I think by the time we finish in a little while, uh, you'll see why I'm doing it the way I'm doing it. But what I hope I can do is get to know you a little bit uh, by asking you a few questions. And you'll, you'll understand why I'm asking those questions, I hope, uh, in just a little bit. But I think it's the normal custom for us to begin with prayer. Uh, so why don't we pray together that uh, God would help us this evening to better appreciate this, not only this story, but also the lessons that we can learn uh, from this story. Uh, so let's pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our loving God, we approach you this evening with uh, hearts of gratitude. Uh, you are so good to us. Uh, often we don't recognize the ways that you are uh, good to us, and so we ask that you would help us this evening uh, to have eyes that can see and ears that can hear what you want to tell us and what you want to show us. Uh, we ask that you would help us to better appreciate this story of Christ's conversation with this woman, this Samaritan woman. Uh, may these few minutes that we spend pondering this story, thinking about it and reflecting on it, uh, help us to better love you and, and know how much you love us and what you call us to do and to be in our lives. Uh, and so we pray that you'll bless us in all these ways. We also ask that you would uh, bless our families and uh, our parishes, uh, that we would all uh, find peace in you and, and that we would also support and strengthen one another. Uh, we pray that you would uh, bless us during the season of Lent as we prepare for Holy Week and Easter. Uh, may we come to know you better uh, through all the disciplines and uh, experiences of this season of the year. And we pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, um, so I'm going to start not by looking at this story, but by asking you to help me with a few things. And so I assume that you have the power to unmute yourselves and to participate. Uh, and so uh, I'm going to ask you a question or two before I go to the next screen. I'll just explain this. Uh, I know that uh, you don't, you probably don't know me. I go to St. Michael's sometimes to speak to adult groups there. Uh, my parish is St. Luke the Evangelist, which is on the southeast side of town uh, by um, uh, Sagemont area, Friendswood. Um, and I teach at Strake Jesuit, which is an all boys Catholic high school. And uh, I've taught there for 20 years or 21 years. And uh, I spend a lot of my time working with the adults at our school, uh, teaching the Catholic faith and, uh, and what our mission at the school is all about. Uh, but I also teach one class of students and, uh, and that's what I love to do. Uh, so that's what I do and that's what I spend my life doing. Um, and uh, I wish I had the opportunity to get to know each of you and uh, what you do and uh, what you're doing in, in your lives and, uh, and how you came to be in the Catholic faith and, and, uh, uh, or wanting to enter into the Catholic faith, whatever the case may be. Uh, but uh, I hope we can have a little bit of a conversation and uh, that you can respond to some of the things that I ask you about. So uh, I'm going to show you a picture, um, not that one, this one. Uh, and I want to see uh, how good your imagination is. Uh, and so anybody, but I'm especially interested in uh, some of the children that I see on there, if you see anything in that tree, uh, but anybody can answer it, uh, adults or, or, uh, or children, uh, when you look at that tree, use your imagination, and do you think of anything when you look at that tree? I like looking at trees, uh, and so uh, what do you see? I see a hand there with Stephanie Volpez. Uh, are you wanting to say something? My name is Esther, and I see with my imagination a tree with lots of branches and a squirrels and me, and it looks like a bird's nest as well. Oh, well, that's great. I didn't see the squirrels or the bird's nest. You got a pretty good imagination. 
anybody else see anything in that tree? Or anything that that tree makes you think of? Yeah, Mary? It looks like all the trees in my backyard, they're dead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Just, it looks like winter time. It does look like winter time, that's for sure. So it makes you think of winter time, okay? Anybody else uh, see anything in there, in the tree? Does it make you think of anything else? Yeah, uh, is that Esther again? Um, the, the branches kind of look like Einstein's hair. Ah, well, that's pretty neat. I didn't think of that one. That's pretty good. Einstein's hair, because his hair is kind of crazy. Uh, it makes me think, looking at it, it makes me think of a road map. You ever seen a road map where streets are going all over the place? It also makes me think of a skeleton, like a skeleton going, various bones and a body. Yeah, I was going to say it looked like a pair of lungs with like the veins and arteries kind of going around it. Ah, that's good too. It does look like uh, veins going all over. Uh, is that Phillips, Philip there? Um, it looks like you're connecting the stars in the sky, making constellations. Ah, that's really cool. You like astronomy? You like stars? Yeah, I love stars when I was your age. Uh, uh, I see another one on Stephanie. Is, what's your name? Is It's not Esther again. Adriana. Adriana. What do you see? On the trick kind of looks like the Holy Spirit. Ah, the Holy Spirit. What, how do you see the Holy Spirit in that? And, I mean, that's really neat. Uh, because of the wind. What's that? Because of the wind. Yeah. Well, that's really cool. Y'all have a y'all have a really good imagination. Uh, let me show you. Um, let's see. That's not what I want to see. Um, here's some more. They, these are sometimes, this is not what I wanted. This is a, not the newest version of this. But here's some other things. Like when people say uh, something is sweet as sugar, sweet as sugar, what does that mean? Like if somebody says to you, Philip, you're as sweet as sugar, what does that mean? Philip? Probably. It means they love you, or probably you're so sweet. Yeah, with that's all the that's tasty good. food you eat. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, it probably means somebody really loves you, and they think you're really sweet. Uh, what about when somebody says your muscles are as hard as a rock? What does that mean? You're really strong. It means you're really strong. Yeah, that's good. When the Bible says the Lord is my shepherd, that's a little harder. What do you think that means? Yeah, Esther. He's my guide. Uh, that's good. He's my guide. Like a shepherd takes his sheep and leads them along and takes them in the right way. God does that for us. Here's another hard one. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah that God measured out the waters of the oceans in the hollow of his hand. The hollow of his hand is just this little part of the hand right here where there's a little dip in your hand. And so if God measured out the waters in the hollow of his hand, that means that all the waters in the ocean can fit in God's hand and he pours them into the ocean. What does that tell us about God? What do you think of when you hear that, Mary? That he is vast beyond understanding. Absolutely. That God is bigger and greater than anything I can imagine. Philip, what do you got? He's creating the earth. Yeah, God created everything. And so God fills the oceans and God's bigger than we can ever imagine, greater than we could ever imagine. Here's another one. This one's kind of hard. See what you can do with this one. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. What do you think that means? That's a tough one. Okay, Philip. 
Then mm, I forgot. Ah, that well, that's okay. Uh, anybody else have a thought? What is uh, if you're if Jesus said that we're the salt of the earth? What do we do with salt? What do we use it for? For flavoring. Yeah, we make things taste good. That's one thing. <laughs> use it. So uh, salt was also used to preserve things like it keeps them from rotting. So if you put meat in salt, that would help it stay better longer. So salt was used to make things taste good. And it was also used to preserve them and to keep them from rotting. So if Jesus says we're the salt of the earth, what does that mean? All right, Philip. And that means we can help the earth. Yeah, that's great. Uh, y'all are really smart. Uh, it means we can help the earth. We make it better. Just like you put salt on your food, it makes it taste better. If we're the salt of the earth, then we're, we're trying to make the world better. We're making things better. Here's another hard one. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. What do you think that means? What's bread good for? Yeah. Uh, Esther's sister. What was your name again? Adrian. Adrian. Okay. Adrian. What what's bread good for? What do you do with it? You eat it. You eat it. Yes, you eat it. And so if Jesus is the bread of life, what might that mean? What do you think that means? Oh, Phillips uh, thinks he got the answer. What is it? It's the body of Christ when you go to communion. Okay, that's and so when we when we eat the bread, it's giving us life, isn't it? It's like nourishing us. It's giving it's feeding us, and so Jesus it feeds us. Uh, he feeds our hunger, not our physical hunger, but he feeds us in a spiritual way. All right, let's uh, let's go to something else um, that's related to that. All right, so here's what I wanna do. I'm gonna show you a video in a minute, uh, about three minute video about the story that we're focusing on uh, this evening, the woman at the well. So I think I should show you that now, that video. And I want you to think about a few questions while we watch it. Uh, one of the questions I want you to think about is, do you think the lady that Jesus talks to is sad? That's my first question. Do you think the lady is sad that Jesus talks to? And if you think she's sad, I think she's sad, but I want you to tell me if you think she is. Do you think the lady is sad? Uh, and also, here's another question. Uh, what do you think Jesus cares most about in the conversation he's going to have? So Jesus is going to be talking to this lady. Uh, and what do you think he cares about when he talks about it? What's he trying to say to her? Uh, and, um, uh, and then after she talks to Jesus, she's all excited and she wants to go tell other people about what she has learned of Jesus. So while you watch this, try to think about those two first questions. Do you think she's sad and why is she sad? And what does Jesus try to give to her or what does he try to say to her? Uh, so let's see how that works. Let's try it. Uh, all right, here's the video. Uh, no, there's the video. Uh, all right, let me make sure I'm turned up here. So let's watch it. Pay real close attention. And then when we finish it, I want to hear what you think, anybody that's in the group. Uh, I'm only looking at like four or five uh, people here. So I know there's more than that in here. Um, so uh, I'll try to look at the others of you and see if you want to participate but uh, I'm going to show you this video and try to focus on those two things. Uh, what is the, is the woman sad uh, or what's her emotions like? And what does Jesus try to offer to her? So here we go. Jesus had been teaching in Judea. He and his disciples began traveling back to Galilee. They traveled through Samaria and stopped in a town with a well. Jesus' disciples went into town to buy food. While Jesus was at the well, 
a Samaritan woman came to get water from the well. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. The woman was surprised. Why are you talking to me? She asked. You are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. Jesus said, I asked you for a drink. You don't know who I am. If you did, you would have asked me for a drink and I would give you living water. The woman was confused. She said, sir, this well is deep and you don't have a bucket. Where do you get this living water? Jesus said, anyone who drinks this well water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks from the water I give will never be thirsty again. In fact, the water I give will become a well inside you and you will have eternal life. Jesus was talking about the Holy Spirit, but the woman did not understand. Sir, she said, give me this water. If I'm not thirsty, I won't have to keep coming to this well to get water. Go get your husband, Jesus said. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus knew she was telling the truth. He said, you don't have a husband now, but you've had five husbands. Jesus was right. I see you are a prophet, the woman said. Maybe this prophet could explain something to her, she said. The Samaritans worship here on a mountain, but the Jews say we need to worship at the temple in Jerusalem. Jesus said, soon you will not need to be in either of those places to worship God in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, when he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus said, I am the Messiah. The woman left and told the people in her town, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? Many Samaritans believed in Jesus because of what the woman said. Jesus stayed in their town for two days. Many more believed because of what Jesus said. They told the woman, we no longer believe because of what you said, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this really is the savior of the world. Jesus offers something better than physical water. He gives us himself. Jesus gives the Holy Spirit to everyone who comes to him by faith. We can worship him as Lord and savior wherever we are. Okay, I think I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and try to look at you. So I'm gonna make, I'm gonna put in a gallery view here so I can see everyone. Most of you have your cameras turned off, but I wanna be able to see those that, that, uh, that your cameras are on. Uh, so you just watched a video about this story that you'll hear about uh, at the mass. And, uh, and there were a couple of questions that I asked you before we started it uh, to see if you, what you think. Uh, the first question was, do you think the lady that came to Jesus or that Jesus was uh, uh, talking with uh, at the well, uh, do you think she was sad? Uh, or what do you think her emotions were when she was talking to Jesus? Any ideas? Philip, you're on fire tonight. You got answers to everything. Uh, what do you think? Confused. Confused. Yeah, there's, yeah, she did seem to be confused. She asked questions. She was confused when Jesus said, I have living water. And she said, How do you have living water? What is that? That's a great, that's a great one, Philip. Uh, that's impressive. Uh, so she was confused. Anything else? Yeah, Stephen? Well, I think she was sad because. As I understand that story, she had to go to the well by herself. And, you know, usually the women would go to the well, I think, as a group in the morning. And she was there by herself, perhaps ostracized from the other members of the community. And she admitted that she had multiple husbands. I think, you know, uh, I think she was probably sad. Yeah, absolutely. I think you're absolutely right. She said, when Jesus said, go get your husband, she said, I don't have one. And he said, well, that's true because you've had five husbands. And so she had had many relationships that didn't work out in her life. 
So she was probably pretty sad. Uh, and like you pointed out, Stephen, she, she might have even been a social outcast. She probably was uh, because of her life. And so she was alone. Uh, and there Jesus encounters her. And she's probably very sad and, and lonely. And uh, there Jesus talks to her. And what does Jesus offer to her? He, he, he talks about the whole reason why I went through all that stuff earlier about what do you see when you look at the tree? And what about all these things we say like hard as a rock or sweet as sugar? We use all these images and, and these what we call metaphors and similes. We use a lot of those things to help us understand spiritual things or, or other things. So what does Jesus, what's the, what's, the, um, what's the thing that Jesus offers to this woman in this story? He, he offered living water. Living and, water. Uh -huh. and, and she didn't know what that was, but he was offering her himself. Yeah. yeah he was the living water and she didn't understand when he said he, she wouldn't need to come back and get water, that he was going to offer himself as living water. Right. So let's think about water for a minute. Uh, when you think about living water, uh, what comes to mind? What do you think of when you hear the words living water? Philip? Water that's alive. Ah, that's really good. Water that's alive. Um, how would water that's alive be different, you think, from the water that you drink out of your sink? What's he saying, do you think, when he says he offers to her living water? What does that mean, you think, Stephanie? I mean, not Stephanie. That's what the screen says. Uh, is this Esther or Adriana? Esther. Esther. And I think it means clean water okay. and healthy water. Okay. But this water, what can this water give that Jesus is offering her? It can give her what? Strength. It can give her what? Strength. Strength. Okay. Something else too. Elvia. Um, it can give her life so she can so she doesn't like if she's thirsty and she doesn't get anything to drink, she won't really live. Yeah, that, that's very good, Elvia. It, it, Jesus is not really talking about our physical thirst here. He's talking about this lady is sad and lonely, and she's, she's done some things that, that, that make her sad. And, uh, and Jesus is saying, I can heal all of that. So it's like he's saying, I can give you a water, a kind of water, not literal water, not the water in your sink. I can give you a water that will make you happy on the inside, that will heal your sadness and, and, will, and will allow you to be in a relationship with God who loves you and who cares about you more than you can imagine. God loves you. Uh, and so he's inviting her, he's welcoming her to come and find water, not physical water, but a kind of water that's going to make her happy forever. She's going to have everlasting life, he says, through this water. Uh, and, um, and so then when Jesus has this conversation with her, what, how does she react to it? What does she do? Do you remember what happens after Jesus finishes the conversation with her? What does she do? She goes back to town and tells everybody that she's met somebody that told her everything she's ever done in her life. And she realizes he's a prophet. Yeah. So she goes back and tells everybody there's this incredible person that I just met who told me all about my life. Now, one interesting thing here is when she goes back and talks about Jesus, she doesn't go back and say, there's this really mean man that just told me all the sins that I ever committed in my life. She went back and was all happy. She believed in Jesus. Why do you think she believed in him? Philip? Because he was the prophet. Okay. She recognized that he was speaking God's words. That's what a prophet does. He speaks God's words. 
reveals God's truth. Uh, but do you think that the woman felt that Jesus really loved her and cared about her? Yes. In the story? I think so. I think that's why she went back, why she was uh, uh, so, so much believed in Jesus is because even though Jesus knew everything about her, he knew all about her life, uh, he still loved her and offered her life. He offered her everlasting life. And so after meeting Jesus, she knew God loves me. And she wanted to go tell everybody about it, that God had sent someone to her to tell her about how much God loves her. So from this story, it's a really, really beautiful story. And there's a lot of stuff in the story. And in just a minute, uh, you know, I'll kind of stop and see if you have any questions about the story. Uh, and I'm, I'm kind of tailoring my comments, you know, to, to everyone here, you know, children and adults alike. But if there are any adult type questions about this story, you know, technical type questions or questions about details in the story, I'm happy to talk about those too. Uh, but uh, was just trying to make this, you know, kind of consistent with the first scrutiny where you're kind of thinking about this story and some of the requests that we make of God uh, this Sunday are going to be requests that God would help us to to see the, the life that he offers to us, to turn away from our sins, uh, to, to, for God to give us the graces to proclaim the good news to the world. And we can see all of that in this story. And so those are the things that I've been trying to kind of focus on in, uh, in this uh, uh, short session here. Uh, but if there are other details of the story, I'm, I'm more than happy to talk about those. Uh, so just by way of, of conclusion or summary of this part of things this evening, uh, I would, I would just kind of focus our attention on uh, the, the general truths that we can learn from this story. Uh, as Jesus encounters this woman, we find, you know, one of the beautiful things I find in the Gospels is how Jesus finds common people, everyday people. He doesn't go to the most rich or the most famous or the most powerful. He goes to people like us that are just normal people. Uh, and he finds them and meets them where they are. Uh, and this lady was hurting. Uh, she had had a very difficult life, it appears. And so Jesus comes to her uh, and he offers her life, offers her everlasting life. Uh, and, uh, and he talks about himself as that living water. And uh, some of you, I think Mary pointed that out, that Jesus is really offering himself here uh, to the woman, uh, that the key to all of her, of her sadness is Jesus, that he's the one that can give her the happiness that she's looking for. And so when she encounters Jesus, she opens herself to that, and then she can't help but run back home and tell everybody in her village, listen, I found the one, perhaps he's the Messiah. He's the one we've been hoping for all these centuries. He's here now. Uh, he's come, and, uh, and, he's, and, and he's wonderful, so let's go see him. Uh, so it's a beautiful story that reminds us of some of the truths that we're focusing on this week. One other thing I would mention is that when we encounter Jesus, like this woman did, our lives are changed by it. And that's another point of emphasis, of course, uh, with the scrutinies, is kind of examining our lives and trying to figure out how can I grow uh, more deeply and, uh, and prepare myself more deeply to enter into this faith more profoundly that I'm uh, that I'm moving toward and that I'm opening myself to. Uh, so, uh, so one of the things that we should, uh, we should highlight in the story is that this woman had a sad life and she had done things that she certainly wasn't proud of. But when she encountered Jesus, that begins to change a person's life uh, uh, because by knowing Jesus, we now want to be more pleasing to him. We want to do the things uh, that help that relationship grow with Jesus. Uh, rather than damage that relationship. Same thing in our families, you know, like if I'm looking at children on the screen, I'm sure you're wonderful children, and, but, I'm, but I'm also sure because I was once a child and I, I raised children in our home, um, I'm also sure uh, that sometimes you do things that don't make your, your parents happy with you. Uh, and hopefully that makes you sad on the inside and you wanna do better. It's the same thing with our relationship to God. Uh, sometimes we do things uh, that are disappointing to God, uh, and, uh, and that makes us want to do better. It makes us want to grow because we love God. We want to do things that make God happy. No. You know, so, uh, so anyway, that's, that's, I think, some of the beautiful truths of this story 
uh, are truths about, yes, we, we do things we're not proud of, but God offers to us life anyway and wants us to grow. Uh, and then he wants us to share that with others around us uh, tell others about how good God has been to us. Okay, let me, um, uh, let me stop and see if there are any questions about this story or any insights that you may have uh, that, uh, that I didn't mention that maybe uh, come to your mind about this story. Uh, any, anything on your mind? Well, I, I think it was really, um, you know, it starts out where the, she's a Samaritan woman and Jesus is a Jew and he is not supposed to be even talking to her. Yeah. In the first place, she's shocked that he's even talking to her. She's there at a different time during the day when all the other women have come to draw water and and he talks to her in a loving way not condescending and like what are you doing here this time of day trying to get water and you know give me some water but he's very loving and kind and um you know she went he wins her heart yeah very good and maybe i can say something about the samaritans just so we know about that uh the samaritans were uh, I mean, go back in the history of, of the, the people of Israel. So you go back to, uh, you know, uh, let's say 2,800 years ago uh, when the Israelites, you might remember the story of, uh, I don't know what all everyone knows here, but remember when Moses led the Israelite tribes out of Egypt, crossed the Red Sea and entered into the promised land. Uh, and then the various tribes of Israel settled in the land. Uh, and then uh, several centuries later, about 500 years later, uh, the uh, a foreign power, the Assyrians, came and conquered uh, the northern tribes of Israel, uh, and then they forced them to intermarry with other people, other people that they brought in, and then they deported others of them. What they were trying to do was to destroy their national identity uh, by destroying their sense of, of uh, family with one another, by forcing them to intermarry with the outsiders. Uh, and so they thought that by doing this, they would then become Assyrians because they're just intermarrying with them. Uh, and so some of them did that, others of them uh, refused to do that. And, uh, and so what happened was you had some of the, the tribes of Israel, especially the ones in the South uh, that, uh, that didn't like the Samaritans because they had intermarried with other people. Uh, think of it like this. I, I was, uh, uh, maybe I can dream up an illustration uh, for the, the younger people in the group. Uh, imagine if you, your whole life, your parents tell you, when you grow up, I want you to get married to a Catholic. Your, their, your whole life, they tell you that. I want you to get married to a Catholic. Uh, and, uh, and then you grow up and you marry someone that's not a Catholic, somebody of another religion altogether. And your parents are so upset by that, that you didn't marry a Catholic. Uh, that they won't talk to you anymore. Uh, and they say, look, if you're not going to marry someone of our faith, then we don't want to have anything to do with you anymore. It's very sad. Uh, but that's kind of what happened with the, the Jews and the Samaritans. The Samaritans were people who had intermarried with people outside of Israel. Uh, and they saw them, the, the Jews saw them as traitors, that they had betrayed their ancestry and that they had betrayed God's covenant and God's relationship with them. Uh, and so they were at war with each other, or not literal war, but they didn't like each other. And so, um, uh, you know, Jesus, in this story, he goes through Samaria, which was not normal. It was normal to go around Samaria. Uh, but Jesus goes through Samaria, and he, uh, and he talks to the man, which uh, is very countercultural. It's not the kind of thing that, that you were supposed to do if you were a good Jewish person. There's another story. Does anybody remember the story? Another story that Jesus tells that has a Samaritan in it. Uh, anybody remember what it was? It's the story of the Good Samaritan, uh, where you had the, uh, the man, the Jewish man, who is going to uh, Jericho from Jerusalem. And there's a very dangerous road. Uh, you, can, you can go there today. I mean, maybe you could go there today. I don't know because of COVID, but you can go if, you're in, if you ever find yourself in Israel. Uh, there's a road, you'd have to ask someone to take you to it because normally you don't, uh, can't go down that road. Many years ago on my first trip to Israel, uh, I was in a bus that went along this little road 
uh, in what's called the Valley of the Shadow of Death. It's a road that goes from Jericho up to Jerusalem. It's the old ancient road. It's a tiny little road uh, that winds along the side of the mountain there. And, uh, uh, and that's traditionally the road that Jesus is thinking about when he tells this story of the Samaritan. And so the Samaritan, uh, or the, the Good Samaritan, so there's a Jew, a Jewish man, who's on his way down to Jericho from Jerusalem. And when I say down, there's a, there's a, uh, uh, the, Jerusalem is high elevation. And so, and Jericho is one of the lowest places on the earth. And so if you go from Jerusalem to Jericho, you're going downhill uh, virtually the whole way. Uh, it's about a 15 mile distance or so between Jerusalem and Jericho. And so Jesus is going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and, uh, uh, and he's beat up by, uh, by robbers that are on the side of the road. Uh, and, uh, and when you think about the story, remember, we're talking about a very narrow road. Uh, I'm talking about, you know, at some points, just big enough for a bus to go down. So maybe, uh, maybe eight, nine feet at some points across. And then it just drops down into a valley uh, way down below. And it was one of the scarier experiences of my life going on a bus along the side of that mountain because uh, there were no rails on the side of it. And we're in a big coach bus and I'm looking out the window straight down into the valley below and I can see burnout cars way down there. It's very dangerous. And uh, so this man, this man is on his way from Jerusalem to Jericho and he gets beat up and left on the side of the road. And, the, and Jesus goes on in the story to say that there was a, a priest that came by and then a Levite that came by. A Levite is someone in the priestly family. They come by and they walk around the man, which they had to really try to walk around this man that was beat up and left laying there dying on the road. They walk around him probably because they're afraid of being unclean, that by touching a dying man, they're unclean themselves uh, ceremonially and they won't be able to sacrifice in the temple and so on. And so they go around the man and keep going. But then along comes a Samaritan and sees this man dying. And he binds up his wounds, puts him on his own donkey and takes him to uh, an inn, a hotel, and pays his bill uh, and says, if he, if he needs anything else, I'll pay for it. And Jesus asked the question, who was really a neighbor to that man? And of course, it was the Samaritan. But when Jesus told that story, by making the Samaritan the hero in the story, that made them angry, the people that were listening to that, because they hated the Samaritans. So in the story we're looking at here from John chapter 4, uh, the good, I mean, the, the Samaritan woman, a good Jewish person would say, oh, she's not worth your time. But Jesus took time to talk to this lady that, that they thought didn't matter. But Jesus thought she mattered. Uh, and that's, I think, a, a beautiful truth here, uh, uh, one of the beautiful truths in this story. Uh, anybody else, any, any questions or thoughts uh, about this story, this really beautiful story? So I, I can't stop this session without hearing something from the little ones. Uh, Philip, what do you think there? Uh, at the end of this meeting, what, uh, what do you think? What do you like that you've heard, Philip? Philip's hiding. What do you like? Okay, well, let's go to, uh, let's see, Elvia's got something she likes. What do you like? Uh, my mom is named El Elvia. My name is Eliana. Oh, Eliana. Well, that's a No, Eliana. Well, what did, what did you, uh, what did you like? Um, I like that we were talking about God. Well, that's good. Well, very good. Yes. Who else? A couple more. Uh, what did you? What do you remember? Or what did you like? Esther, you look like you're thinking. What did you like? Um, I liked that you ought to share um, two or three stories of the girl of the well and the. The other one, I forget what it's called. The Samaritan. Yeah. Yeah, the Good Samaritan. Very good. Thank you. Now, Philip, you've been thinking there. I can see your hair. What are you thinking? I guess he's going to be stubborn. That's what that's what students do at Strike Jesuit too. When they don't want to when they don't want to participate, they show you the top of their heads. Okay. Well, I don't think I got to meet uh, on, on the screen with Paul. Mary, what did you want to say? I wanted to say that um, thank you for doing that 
this evening. Uh, I think the reason that we don't have as many adults is the president is speaking right now. Oh, well. I wanted to let you know my son, John, graduated from Strake in 1984. Okay. Um, got a wonderful education, went on to Duke and went to UT Law School. And he is a lawyer here um, in Houston and still does some work at Strake to, um, to help out there. And great. it's a great place. Yeah, well, thanks so much, Mary. Uh, tell him hello for us. I will. Yeah, great. Okay. Uh, <laughs> any, anybody else, uh, a last minute thought on this story? or anything. All right. Well, it's been a real pleasure being with you. And uh, I hope that the rest of Lent and Holy Week and Easter is uh, a wonderful time. Thank you. Thank you. Y'all are so nice. It's been really nice uh, interacting with you and uh, spending some time with you.